ah, 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 to give us all the hydrology we need. And then we just have to learn a little bit about fluid flows or speak to some fluid flow scientists. And then we just simulate the thing. It's this fantastic project and it'd be used, you know, maybe around the world, but certainly around Australia to um, in investigate the impact on... So anyone interested in simulations, especially physical simulations, and anyone interested in large-scale supercomputing, that's a fun project that's just popped up. So if you want to do it, let me know and you can full run with it in the holidays. Well, uh, the supercomputer should turn up in a couple of weeks, but I'll be busy for about a month, what probably. Well, it's a, it's a, G a four GPU um, Tesla thingy. Yeah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so how much 960 cores. Uh, yeah. Awesomely good. Very exciting. And we may be going to get a PlayStation cluster as well. So it's very exciting. So whatever we need, we can get. Um, Thurston's just drooling at the mouth because he loves supercomputing. Yeah. What's that? Yeah, it'll be in the holidays. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Once the course is finished, because I'm too busy now. Once the course is finished, then we just get together and we just work out crazy stuff. And you probably get to fly all around Australia and scuba dive and see shipwrecks and all sorts of amazing things. It'd be very cool. Yeah. yeah it's about the project. Um, so whenever Dracula goes to sea, everyone knows about it, right? Yes. Um, in the past play stream, there's only two spots to record where Dracula moved, right? What do you mean? Like, if he doubled back, it would be D and then a number. Yes. And if he went to C, it would be S and a question mark. Yes. Um, what if he doubled back to a C location? Yeah. Then... Oh, yeah, we didn't used to allow doubling back to C. That's a good question. Does anyone know? Do we allow doubling back to C now? Can, oh, we used to not allow doubling back to C, and now we allow doubling back to C. Okay. Or you can just make it. We'll have to say that Dracula will never double back at C. Okay. Because otherwise we can't tell you. Oh, oh, here. Uh, no, no one here would know. Oh, Theo will know. Do we allow Dracula to double back at sea? I can actually open up the game rules. Does it say? Yes. It was in the rules and I simplified it out, and now he's pointing out it's a disaster because now you don't know if Dracula's at sea if he's doing a double back. Uh, no, you don't. Oh, he got two spots. Okay. According to the rules, he can. He can. All right. All right, there you go. So we'll have to change it so Dracula doesn't lose blood on a double back at sea. Or on a hide at sea. Wait, so he we can't, can't know. He can't hide at sea? Phew, we left that in. Okay, so he doesn't lose blood on a double back at sea. Wait, so he can double back at sea, but we'll never know. Yeah, yeah that's right. Oh, well, yeah, you might deduce it later on. We know, because... Oh, yeah, you do know. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You do know, because you know which one he's double back to. And you know that that was a C one. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, I told you. No, you don't know which C. It doesn't matter. Well, so, but, like, when he does it, you won't know he's at C. Yes, you will. He will do a double back three, so you count back three, and you'll see that that's C question mark. Confusingly, uh, question. Yeah. Aha. Okay. Okay. We both had a little fright there. Um, all right. Hello, everyone. Let's um, let's resume. Before we start, uh, someone just had a really good question about um, the application of RSA. Because we've just looked at the um, algorithm itself, but an algorithm is only as good as how well you use it. In fact, in cryptography or in security, we find, amusingly, that things normally break not because the crypto breaks, because the crypto is normally the strongest thing about it, it's because it's used in an idiotic way. Uh, so who had the question? Someone had a question about the crypto. Who, yeah. Uh, oh, what's your name? Uh, David. David. Yep. Was it, was it you that was asking the question that I said, sit down and ask me that question? Yes. Ask me that question first, then ask me the related question. Okay. I oh, know that is a related question. Oh, ask away. Yep. Okay. Um, how, how can we possibly implement um, something that, if our code has to decrypt a message, and the humans can look at our code, and it has to know some sort of key or even some sort of privacy beforehand, how can we, how can we keep, how is there a way to keep the information? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a very good question. So essentially, and this question goes to the heart of security, the heart of cryptography, the heart of secrecy. If your adversary knows nearly everything, how can you possibly create the security environment you want? If you want to have a, 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 a confidential channel between us, I need to somehow be able to distinguish you from the adversary. And if you know everything that the adversary knows, how can I distinguish you from the adversary? It's very hard. So we did see you could use, just sort of warming up to this, you could use, oh, so, and of course the whole idea with uh, cryptography is you can't ever make everything, anything completely secure. There's no such thing as a magic message that only reveals itself to the recipient, not to anyone else. All you can do is take a secret and turn it into another secret. So uh, th that's how I lock 
um, my safe, for example. Uh, well, no, not even locking my safe. Let's just say a secret to a secret. A secret to a secret works like I take my whole message that I want to keep secret, I encode it with a publicly known algorithm, but I use a key that I keep secret. So I've compressed the secrecy and now I've just got to keep this tiny little key a secret. And I can use the same key over and over again. So I only have to keep one secret and I can have lots of messages based on that key. So this, this notion of where you push the secrecy into, you want to push it into as small a space as possible and make the secret easy to move around. Now, Actually, sorry, I just realized. You realize how to do it. Okay. If you use, if you use like the VNL combination. Well, so that, yeah, so that, yeah, yeah. So th I was going to say, there's three ways that, uh, there are three sort of approaches I can think of, and I bet you guys could think of more if you kept thinking. One is you could use the first round of messages that the adversary is not allowed, that we're not allowed to read. In that first round of message, you could exchange keys and secrets between you and then use those keys for the rest of the conversation from then on. So you do have one untappable channel initially. Two is you could use Diffie-Hellman, which sort of creates a key out of nothing. And in fact, this is how common internet protocols work. They use Diffie-Hellman up front to, to create shared keys between us, and then we use RSA, or well, actually we don't use RSA, it's too slow. We use some other thing, AES or something like that. Yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. So we use some sort of key establishment protocol up front, and then we use some other protocol to communicate between us that's from then on. That's how, that's how SSL works, for example. It uses Diffie-Hellman, sets it up. Um, but the third way is RSA has this really nice property. It's what's called a public key crypto system. And this solves that problem, the problem of how can we distinguish the adversary from the intended recipient of the message? if ev the adversary can hear everything that's going on. So RSA, for example, public key cryptography would actually solve this problem even if you didn't have that initial hidden round of information being hidden. Here's how a uh, trivial crypto system works. M maybe my crypto system is, a crypto system is uh, I encode every letter by adding a constant to it, and I wrap round mod 26. So you give me a message, I add 5 onto every letter. So my key is the number 5. Obviously, that can be brute force. There's only 26 possible keys, so it's a stupid system for a start. But the interesting thing to notice here is that I add 5 to every message to encode it. You decode by subtracting 5 from every letter. So it's the same. If you know the key that's used to encrypt, then you know enough to decrypt. And this is called a symmetric crypto system. Symmetric cryptography is if you know how to encrypt, then you know how to decrypt. Now, the problem with this is if I want to send a message to Liam, then we have to, and he wants to be able to decrypt it, then necessarily he has enough information to know how to encrypt. I actually didn't say the implication goes the other way, but it goes both ways. So he can send messages pretending as me, and he can decrypt other messages from me. There's all these complicated problems, and somehow that, yeah, okay. It's nice. It, it, it makes it much simpler to come up with an algorithm where the same key encrypts and decrypts, like your house. Hey, you go to your house, you need, it's got a deadlock on the door. It's the same key to lock it and unlock the house. That means um, it's very convenient. You've only got to carry one key. Everyone that comes to your house you can, that you need to give access to, you can just give them one key. It's very simple to manage and maintain and look after keys. But it has all the obvious shortcomings that if you ever give a key to a bad person, that person now has full access to your house and so on and so on and so on. And it's hard to get all the keys back once you've handed them out and all sorts of things. Public key crypto works a different way. In public key crypto or asymmetric key crypto, you have two keys. One is the encrypt key that I call E before. One is the decrypt key, called D. You encrypt with the encrypt. So but the example we had before, I think it was three. You raise it to the power of three to encrypt it, and you raise it to the power of 215 to decrypt it. The interesting thing is knowing the encrypt key doesn't tell you anything about the decrypt key. And knowing the decrypt key doesn't tell you anything about the encrypt key. So you can only work out one from the other if you know P minus one, Q minus one, and you can find the inverse. If you don't know P minus 1 and Q minus 1, knowing one of those two keys doesn't tell you anything at all about the other key. So here's the amazing thing. You want to send me a message, and you don't want the adversary to be able to overhear it, to be able to decode it. There's no way we can communicate with each other and exchange keys, because the adversary will hear everything. So here's what I do. I say to you, hey, my encrypt key is 3. Adversary, I don't care if you hear it. It's 3. <laughs> 3. Now, you can send me messages. The adversary has overheard our conversation, so he knows the encrypt key. Well, big deal. What can he do with the encrypt key? He can send me messages too. But the encrypt key doesn't let you decrypt things. 
And you can't work anything out about the decrypt printing. I don't tell anyone the decrypt key. I call that my private key, my secret key. And the one that I tell everyone, I call my public key. But then how do the people decrypt it if they've only got your encryption key? They don't decrypt it. I'm the only one in the world that can decrypt that message. What's the point of the message? The point of the message is he wants to send me something confidentially, so he encrypts it with my public key, and I am the only person in the universe that can decrypt it because I'm the only one that knows the private key. And the nice thing about this is I don't have to transmit the private key at all, so the adversary can't get it in transmission. I don't think you're the only one in the universe who knows your private key. My question is, will the tutors be able to look at your code and see your private oh, key? Oh, I see. That's what my question uh, is. His question is, will the tutors be able to look at the code and see the private key? Well, yes, if it's in your code. But aren't the tutors looking at all that code? Yeah, so if you put the private key in the code, they'll be able to see it. So in a similar way. So randomly generate a private key. Yeah, but then, how, but then you have the problem of authentication, but it's really... No, you don't. Well, you don't because... But we have to make sure... That Yeah, you have, to make, you have to make sure that the public key that's being distributed to you is actually the public key of the person you really, really think it is. You don't have to maintain a statement collection. Uh, so you can't actually remember your public key from last time, unless it's in the code. No, but you can... Oh, I see, you can't remember your public key. Oh, that's a problem. Oh. Oh. Uh, so you remember your public key, but you can never remember your private key. It's such a good secret. You don't even remember it yourself. Unless you send it in the first round. You're going to have to send it in the first round, yeah. Because our situation is worse than a normal... Uh, a normal situation is you assume the adversary can intercept all communications, and the only thing that's private is your mind. And unfortunately, in this scenario, even your mind's not private. The adversary can just make you forget everything every time you send a message. You start afresh every time. It's, Memento. Your memento and the adversary can read any post-it notes you stick on your body. So, yeah, so you're going to have to write your public key in the first round. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just thinking if the public key, if, if you randomly generate the public key every time, yeah. it's, it's, it's so unreliable. Like, how do you, like, someone else could have generated that. But that's not a problem. The chance of two, two people having the same public key are negligible if your end's big enough oh. and it's a message posted by you in the first round saying what it is. you always know it's from this player. Yes. So yeah, because it's tied to him in that round. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we're we certainly not trying to deal with the authentication problem here. I think that's what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. This doesn't solve the authentication problem, but luckily the authentication problem is sort of solved for you in that messages belong to players in a way that is outside faking in the system. Yeah. Unless your tutors are diabolical and overflow messages into previous ones or something. Yeah, if the Dracula ever works out how to change messages, you're in trouble. Oh, fantastic. Oh, pick anyone. It doesn't really matter. It's the, oh, and money. Oh, cool. Does everyone else have the $10 you're going to bring me today? <laughs> These tickets cost negative $10. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Um, if N is too short, yes. would that mean it just get passed through without, if M is too small? Yes, if M's a small number, yeah. I think you're noticing that if N's a small number and we're not raising it to a big power, it might not even wrap around. Is that what you're sort of saying? Yeah, yeah. So, but in practice, it's very unlikely you'll send an M that's really small like that. Certainly, yeah. Look, pay attention to that. It might not happen. Yep, yep. Pay attention to that. If you're just encrypting really short messages, then it's hopeless. And, and in fact, someone, David was suggesting before, you really, and you guys, actually, we shouldn't be having this discussion. You have it on the forum amongst yourselves. He's got ways of solving that problem. It's a good option. Yeah, yeah. No, just tell them. Don't tell me, I mean, because I'm, I'm trying to crack it. So he's already worked out how to solve that. That's a very good question, Cameron. Okay, now, um, I did, I, so I wanted to talk about, uh, talk about um, something to do with uh, breadth-first search and depth-first search. Just a reminder of what it is, because one of the tutors told me that people couldn't remember what was breadth-first and what was depth-first. I'm pretty sure everyone that's turned up today can remember. But how I always uh, uh, picture it is I uh, have a movie example in my mind, which is, has anyone seen the film Run, Lola, Run? Yes. An excellent movie. In Run, Lola, Run, or oh, describe, Liam, how does it go? Um, okay, so this woman... Um, Lola? Yeah, she has this uh, <laughs> uh, situation with her boyfriend. I can't remember it completely. D d d d d d d d skip over the details. Yeah, yep. But basically, she keeps doing the same um, event over again with different outcomes each time. Yes. She keeps... Uh, she keeps uh, it's like Groundhog Day for her, in a sense, that uh, she uh, wakes up, has a very stressful day, trying to help her boyfriend, and fails and dies or something, and then wakes up 
and has another shot and tries again and dies or he dies or something and then wakes up. Does that make sense? And the whole movie is this same sequence over and over again. Now familiar, I know, but at the time it was revolutionary. Uh, and incredible steady cam work. And also a really crap film that came out at the same time called Sliding Doors, Doors uh, with Gwyneth Paltrow in it. And it was not completely crap, but in this film, has anyone seen Sliding Doors? Has anyone seen anyone prepared to admit they've seen it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Guys, you've got to get out more. Like I'm, gonna, I'm gonna tell you how the film goes. It's like this. Gwyneth Paltrow is having a crap day. She goes down to catch a train, and there's like sliding doors on the train. And as she's going down the stairs, she bumps into someone or something happens. And just as she gets there, the door's shut in her face and the train moves out. And she's standing on the, I can't remember what happens next, I'm making all the rest up. Uh, she's standing on the platform, lonely and sad, and she meets someone who's there and they become friends and this leads to that and this leads to that. And she, all these things happen and she breaks up with a boyfriend, loses a job. And all these incredible things happen arising from her missing that one train. I think she might have go home and discover a boyfriend having an affair or something or something or something. And the whole, you see her whole life, but every scene cuts between, that, that only lasts for a few seconds or a minute, and then it cuts to her running down the stairs again, but this time she just misses a person on the stairs, just makes it and the door shut and she's on the train. And then the rest of the film is cutting between these possible worlds. And you see her life moving in completely different directions just based on this one thing of whether she got through the doors. On, it's like the butterfly wing thing. But the interesting thing for, about it for me is Run, Lola, Run is, of all the possible lives she could have, Run, Lola, Run is exploring them in what way? Depth. Depth first. It's going through the whole life and then starting again. And then going through the whole life and starting. Whereas Sliding Doors is exploring it in what way? Bread first. Shows a little bit of this life, then a little bit of that life, and a little bit of this life. And maybe if there were nine ways you could have forked at that time, you'd see all nine slowly moving. Okay. So there you are. That's how you remember the difference. Um, next thing I wanted to talk about was finite state automata. I just wanted to mention them really briefly, because they're a nice example of a, a graph-like structure having some use in a sort of unfamiliar way. A finite state automata is just a very simple picture you can draw with states and transitions between them. And the transitions are things happening, and you draw them as arcs, so it's like a graph. And you use finite state automata for all sorts of interesting things, and they can model programs nicely. And one thing you use them for is um, accepting or rejecting languages, or parsing. Parsing is you take some syntactical structure, which is a whole lot of tokens or items, and you move over it, and at the end you decide this is a syntactically correct program, or this is a sentence in English, or this is a conjunctive thing, or this is or that. So you move over it, and at the end you make some sort of semantic decision, that's called parsing. Well, finite state machines are really good at representing parsing problems. So, for example, if you wanted to notice if, uh, suppose what's going to happen is we're going to go around a circle and everyone in the circle is going to clap. And at the end, everyone's going to do one clap. And at the end, we have to decide whether we've done an even or an odd number of claps. And we're going to accept strings that are an even number of claps and reject them if they're an odd number of claps. Then it would go something like this. We'd start off in this state, which is our initial state. Start state. And you'd say, if you get a clap, move to this state. If you get another clap, move to that state. And we'd say, this state is called success, and this state is called fail. Or, oh, well, let's make it even more precise. This state's called even, this state's called odd. And now you just watch the system play out. So you go, oh, okay, get a clap, get another clap, get a clap, get another clap, get a clap, get a... and the system just goes on like this. And at the end, whatever state you're in tells you whether you had an even or odd number of things. And in fact, that's one way of implementing the is even function in the uh, assembly code, in machine code. Some people did it this way. Uh, it's a very fast way of detecting even or odd. Does that make sense, how that works? And it's a graph. And the graphs can be heaps more complex and detect heaps more complex things. What if you wanted to detect if a number was divisible by three? What would that look like? Yeah, this is... I'm <laughs> only drawing like a cycle, it's pretty trivial, but you can see we can extend it to be like that. What if we wanted to accept, and that's our accept state, that's yes, divisible by three, that's no, that's no, and that's if you get a clap, that's if you get a clap, that's if you get a clap. What if the game goes round and you have to say um, boojum after every third clap? Does anyone know that game? There's a game like that. What is it called? I can't remember. David's here. What was that game you were talking about yesterday? Fizz buzz. You say fizz after every... It's divisible by two. Fizz, fizz, all right, fizz if it's divisible by two. Fuzz if it's divisible by three. Fuzz if it's divisible by three. And fizz buzz if it's both. And fizz buzz if it's divisible by both. And you've got to play this game, and we've got to tell if someone's passed or failed the game. So how we do it is we'd say, 
Ooh. Well, let's do that. So how are we going to just check if it's fizz? What we'd say is clap, clap. That's a clap. And then we move to this state where it's even. Well, actually, what are we going to expect the person to do before they... Uh, they're going to have to clap, and then they're going to have to say... Oh, that's complicated. Uh, I'm basically, I want to have someone saying fizz. And that's a clap. And that's a fail. That's a clap. That's a fizz. Have we got it right? Oh, no, that fizz there's a fail. And that's a clap. So everyone has a fizz and a clap coming up. Oh, and a fizz here. <laughs> What's funny? It's like three lines of C. It's like three lines of C. Oh, yeah, I know. It's the same thing. But a finite state automator is just like three lines of C. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just want to show the different states you can move through here. Okay. Yeah, I know. I mean, the, the reason we la he's laughing is when we were talking about this problem yesterday, we were talking about how people give ridiculously complicated solutions to this problem, and that's exactly what we're doing here. But no, but this is actually, but a finite state automator is in a sense really primitive. Like, uh, if you were going to encode a finite state automator in C, that would be ridiculous. But C itself will end up having your pro flow control for the C program, if correctly written, will look exactly like this. So here's how we start with the programmer's obsession that. Um, the person that starts has to say fizz because zero is divisible by two. You'll notice from this initial state, if you clap initially without saying fizz, you fail, it's over. But if you say fizz, that's looking good. And then if the next person says fizz, that's a fail. But if we hear a clap, then that's good. And then if we hear a fizz, that's a fail. But if we hear a clap, that's good. And then next we're expecting to hear a fizz, clap, clap, fizz, clap, clap. So I've only got it doing fizzes at the moment. Now, how would you get it to do buzzes as well? Well, you'd need to have a, a circle of six things, wouldn't you? <laughs> Moving around slowly. With here, exactly what you're expecting to see. And then the file alternative coming off each one. And from every one, you can either say a fizz or a buzz or a clap or a fizz buzz. And probably needs a few more states in there, because you need a state after you said a fizz or a buzz. But this fully describes the system. Yeah, yeah. Does that make sense? But, it's, uh, but again, it's a loop. It's not very interesting. But you can have very interesting finite state automators. So maybe, maybe I'll think of a, one I can put as a brownie point question or something. And you can think about it. How to represent a certain problem as a finite state automator. But essentially, they're a graph. And executions of the machine turn out to be paths in the graph. And it's a directed graph. So just because there's an arc from here to here doesn't mean there's going to be an arc going back the other way. And the arcs have labels, so you can have multiple. It's a multigraph. Okay, uh, so that's another example of graphs. And that's a really cool thing in computer science. You'll see heaps of that when you get onto parsing and translation courses, because they're courses that take in streams of tokens, and then based on the tokens they get, move from one mechanically from one state to another, to another, to another, to another. And then when you reach the accept state, the end of the line or whatever, you've got to check that it, you think, oh, I'm in the, I've just read a go to, or I'm in the, I've just finished an if statement, or I'm in the, and it'll tell you where you end up, exactly what you've just read, if that makes sense. 